Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, let me, uh, so uh, introducing um, our um, chair for the next uh, uh, discussion and brainstorming session uh, on fairness and privacy. That's uh, Gita Kutiniak. Uh, is she online? Gita had a family uh, emergency this morning. Oh, okay. So she unfortunately I, had to travel to her mom that was very sick. So, so unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to so be we, holding the fort. Great. We, we thank her for her great work uh, leading <clears throat> up to the workshop or discussion session. And also then um, the Professor Guillermo Shapiro from Duke University, then he will preside the uh, brainstorm and the discussion on privacy and uh, fairness. Okay. Uh, it's all yours, Guillermo. Thank you very much. And it, it, we are trying to be informal. So we have two outstanding speakers, but I basically gonna let them decide if uh, Anna Andrea uh, uh, Stoika and Salon, who who of you two wanna go first? Uh, I'm fine with either one, so I'm letting you decide. So the idea is about half an hour uh, talk each, uh, and then we can open for for discussion. That's that's what we plan. I'm I'm very excited about those talks. So. Any preference from either uh, uh, one of you uh, to, to go first? Uh, okay, so so Anna Andrea, do you wanna go first? Is that okay with you? That sounds good, I can go first. Okay, please. And, and Solon, I assume it's okay with you because you gave me the thumbs up uh, yep. there, so. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, uh, Guillermo, for um, inviting me to the workshop. I'm really excited to talk to everyone about uh, my work and to open it up to discussions about issues of fairness in, 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 um, in this field. So I'm going to start sharing my screen, if that's OK. Absolutely. And let me just, just inform, uh, in particular, the speakers. Uh, one of the problems with Zoom is you start seeing the amount of people, and you start saying, oh, you know, somebody dropped. There is a parallel YouTube channel, and and a lot of people are there. I was one. I spend most of my week on the YouTube channel and not on the Zoom channel. So don't don't think that the faces that you see here are the only faces listening to you. There is a lot of people listening on the. It's less risky. You cannot open your camera or your microphone by mistake. So a lot of people go into the YouTube channel. I'm not saying that the people that are listening now should drop, but I'm just telling you that that happening and also they stay recorded for, for others. So uh, without any addition, just if you could share your screen and then, yeah, looking Sounds forward good. to that. Yes, thank you for the information. So I'm sharing my screen now. Um, so a quick info on me, I'm, a, I'm Anna, I'm a PhD student at Columbia and I work there with my advisor, Augustine Chantreau on issues related to social networks and fairness and how can we redesign algorithms to mitigate bias in graphs. So I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I wanna talk about a couple of projects that um, relate to influence. So how messages diffuse in networks as well as recommendation algorithms and some of the insights and obstacles that we found in working in this problem. So please feel free to interrupt at any point with questions or thoughts you might have. This is meant to be interactive. And if you have any, um, any comments at all, uh, I'd be happy to take them at any point. So um, to get started on that, the, we're looking at problems that are, that are trying to understand inequality and bias in graph structures. And um, if we start with, with, with graphs that model interactions between people, oftentimes you get that there is a certain bias that comes from society. And whatever algorithm you're gonna, you're gonna implement for that is gonna lead to a biased outcome. Um, but then the first question is, what does it mean to have a biased outcome? And that depends a lot on the problem that you're looking at. So whether you have a recommendation, suggesting people to connect to other people in the graph, you can look at the people or communities that are left out or receive worse or less recommendations in general. If you're looking at problems of how does an information diffuse in a social network, you can look again at people who are left out of this uh, process. So um, the, 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 even the definition of the problem depends a lot on the context that you're looking at. Um, 
And in, in these two particular problems, the problem of social influence maximization, where I'm gonna describe shortly both of them and the recommendation algorithms problem, the main question is where does inequality come from as well as bias? And how can we redesign algorithms to mitigate that? There's been a lot of work that comes from machine learning algorithms to, um, uh, to understand bias and to, to create notions of fairness for that. So um, we'll try to give a short overview of how can we use some of those, what are the issues in using some of those definitions in these cases as well. All right, so to get started on the first problem in social influence, um, this problem relates to how information propagates through a social network. And that uh, has applications in the news that we read, in the technologies or products that we hear about, in running marketing promotions, so the advertisement that we see, and in large campaigns, so in public health issues. And this is the topic that I wanna focus in in this particular problem, in the case where you're looking at public health issues. So when you're running a large campaign as opposed to small targeted campaign that you might do in advertisement. And this is, has, I guess the, the, the most, the best example or the worst at the same time would be to, to think about the spread of COVID and the kind of health, healthcare guidelines that we're able to give and the campaigns that are being run um, by governments in, in, uh, mainly to inform the population best of um, the latest updates. So there's been many works related to social influence in other topics. So thinking about how people can get to different opportunities. This is a study about how people can learn about microfinancing loans and trying to understand the, the, how to model it in the case of uh, spreading this information um, between uh, people in rural villages in India. And um, there's been other works trying to understand the effects of that in other types of uh, public health campaigns, so to raise awareness about HIV among the homeless youth. And what all these studies find, and what we also find is that it is a difficult problem to model and to truly understand. We can do just as much with the models that we have, but they do provide some good insights on an intuition about how can we redesign and think about information that reaches everyone. So formally, the problem that of social influence is the following. You have a network of people that are connected to each other and you want to give a message. You want to make sure that the message is getting to people in, in, in the best way. So you're reaching as many people as possible. So what you want to do is to pick the best K people. And this is a, you have a resource that you can spend to a budget on how big your initial campaign can be in order to, for these initial early adopters to get this information. Now they're gonna spread this information to their friends who are gonna then give it to their friends and this process is going to cascade. And in the end, um, everyone accepts this information with a certain probability. And in the end, you end up with an outreach that you're trying to maximize. So the question is, how do you pick these early adopters? If you pick people who are already very central, who are connected to a lot of people, for example, you may have a better chance of reaching in the long run more people. Whereas if you're picking people in, the, you're in your early campaign who are more on the on a, not as well connected or on the edge of your network, then you might end up not reaching that many people. That's kind of the intuition behind the different algorithms that have been proposed to solve this. And of course, if you're working with biased networks, the, the algorithms that choose based on this centrality are efficient in the sense that they do maximize, uh, they can maximize outreach in a good way, but they do reinforce certain biases. So people who are already very central uh, already have a, an advantage of getting this information faster, giving it to their friends who are already in their, in their more prominent circles and so on. And what ha ha we have noticed is that um, if, you're, if you're trying to give this information in a, through greedy algorithms, which are often the best in terms of efficiency to approximate an optimal spread, you, and you do this through ignoring the community affiliation of people, you are prone to reinforcing this bias. So one way to think about it is to think of people pertaining to different communities. So here I'm portraying that through people who are blue and red, that can mean their demographics, 
Um, so race, gender, that can mean their interests, whether they're like personal interests, political affiliation, and many others. And you, 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 we think about this in terms of different communities that exist in the network. Some of them are more uh, dominant and some of them may be in minority. So how do these affect these different communities differently and what we can do about that? There's been some diversity interventions to show, um, to, to try to solve this issue, to try to spread information to different communities. Um, as, as I, so not advantaging a single man, majority community. And these works are often posing this problem as a, as a constraint, having a constraint to reach statistical parity in the outcome that you get uh, through the optimization function that you have. For example, in your greedy algorithm, you're maximizing outreach. You may pose as a constraint a fairness condition, the condition that you want to reach a representative number of each community, for example. And what they show is that by doing this, you end up with a fairness efficiency trade-off. So the more fair you're trying to be in reaching different communities, the fewer people you're going to reach overall. And the efficiency of the system here is again related to the outreach. How many people do you get with your uh, in 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 your in spreading information? So, um, in our in, in in this approach, I wanted to present a model of of networks in which we know partial information, in which we can focus on centrality measures such as the number of the connections that someone has. And um, to show that if, if we're thinking about adding this diversity constraint for the early adopters, and we're thinking about tapping the groups that haven't really been reached yet, um, we can actually uh, characterize exactly when, what are the conditions in which being more fair can actually increase efficiency in your outreach. And we get to cases in which there is no fairness efficiency trade-off. So, in here, there are many. There were many modeling questions of how do we how do we model inequality and the spread, and and these are the ones that we've been working a lot to try to get some intuition um, to 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 how this process works. So I want to I'm going to spend a few minutes on describing this project in detail to get that intuition and related to the recommendation algorithms project as well. So. In this project, we're looking at this bias as, the, as a sign of, it turns out it's a sign of inefficiency in the system of spreading in, in uh, information. And beyond of, from diversity being beneficial in general from um, many works that show that, we, we, we get to an intuition in which when you're tapping into inactivated communities, you are actually getting to people who have not received this information firsthand. So, you're not overlapping your spheres of influence from groups that are already majority, already very uh, dominant in the network. So in order to, to understand this process, we're looking at two ways of choosing these early adopters, two ways of seeding. So the, these first seeds that you, you're, you're putting into the network in order to spread and cascade this information. You can do it agnostically, ignoring the labels um, and ignoring the community affiliation which already takes into account the network structure, and this is how traditional algorithms do it. The other approach that we're looking at for comparison is by being aware of the label. So having an, an awareness of the different communities that exist. And here we're looking at two, we're looking at blue and red, for example. And the condition that we're looking at for, for having um, a fair diffusion of information is to have this notion of statistical parity in the early adopters, which means that the fraction of early adopters that you're choosing um, uh, who, who are from different communities is the same as the one in, general, in the general population. The hope for that is that this, perp th this kind of condition will also um, cascade at the level of the outreach and we would get to a fairer outreach. So uh, to briefly talk about the model that we're looking for in this case is a model of network growth that includes a preferential attachment model. So what happens is the following. We ha you have two groups of people, blue and red, and people come into the network, they get a blue label and a red label with a certain probability and the blue label is majority. So the fraction of red nodes is going to be less than half. 
then the person who comes into the network will connect to another node. And it will do that with, pro with probability proportional to its degree. Now that leads to this rich get richer effect, the same as the preferential attachment model in which people who already have a high degree tend to get more and more connections. And this is a, uh, this is a, a property that we see in a lot of online networks from like the topology of the web to many online like citation networks or online platforms in which we get a skewed degree distribution, a skewed number of connections. Very few people have a high degree and, and most of them um, have few number of connections. And the third part, which is also equally important, is that uh, it's homophily. It's people who have different, um, different labels uh, tend to connect less. And this models this notion that con communities that are similar really connect more with each other, which is again an effect that we see in, in we know from sociology and we see in a lot of different um, online networks. So what we get from this model is the following, is a model that firstly we can analyze and I'm gonna show you some quick results on that. Um, and more than that, the, the uh, analysis of this model shows that the two communities have a skewed degree distribution. It follows a power law, which we know from the general preferential attachment model. But having these two communities also shows us that they have two different coefficients. So beta for R, one coefficient for the red community and one for the blue community. And what it shows is that the blue community gets a much, much different degree distribution with a different community. Uh, we, we, sorry, with a different coefficient and because of that, they, they end up with having this bias in their degree distribution that it may be, it's catching more of this bias than just looking at the average degree. So what is this catching exactly through this different degree distribution? There's been this notion of looking at a glass ceiling effect, which simply means that if you're looking at nodes who have um, degree, uh, who are degree at least K, so top K would be the number of nodes with degree at least K, then the minority group, the red nodes are gonna have a vanishing fraction of this uh, degree. So as you move towards nodes with higher degree, the minority group just ends up being vanishing uh, compared to the majority. And that's an effect that you get from this different degree distribution. That's the kind of inequality you see very prominently in a lot of um, in, a, in a lot of applications. And it's really explaining why it's not only on the average people have a different degree, but especially for people who are popular, you end up with a minority that's just inexisting there. Um, and we see that in a lot of uh, academic fields in, but as well, it just also in the way people connect online. So if we're choosing people to diffuse information based on their number of connections, which seems like a good metric, and it is a good metric in practice that is not as computationally heavy as a greedy algorithm, but you're simply choosing the, the nodes that are have the highest degree in the network to diffuse this initial information, to be your early adopters. So let's say you have a budget for that, and you're not looking at, the, at, the, at their community affiliation, you're not looking at their color, it's agnostic seating. So you're simply choosing a, uh, the, the top K nodes uh, based on degree. And this algorithm is a degree centrality one that diffuses information pretty well. Um, this is our baseline. What we can do with this is to say, okay, but I want to be a little bit more fair in the choice of early adopters. So let's say I want to make sure that I have the minority group is well represented in the, in the choice of early adopters. So I can, I can enforce this parity condition called in this case a parity seating by simply adding more nodes from this degree hierarchy in the early adopter seed and removing some of the blue nodes. What I would mean is means I have a higher threshold for degree for choosing the top blue nodes and a lower one for the red nodes. Remembering that the red nodes here are in minority. We can also do something that's a relaxed version of that. That's not a strict condition to have a parity um, uh, condition for it. So diversity seeding, it's just something that it's in between agnostic and parity. So the, the, the main questions here are, okay, how do these perform? Are we really better off 
by making this different choices, by enforcing this diversity conditions in the early adopters? Is there a trade-off that we find in the outreach or not? And the main condition is that we need to keep the same budget. We can't just add no, the more nodes you would add to an early adopter, so the better outreach you'd have. But generally you have a budget, whether that budget is spent on promotion or on sending emails or the, 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 depending on how your campaign is being run. So what we find about this is that actually diversity and parity seating do lead to fairer outreach. That is intuitive because um, we start from a more representative sample and then that representativeness kind of cascades into, in, into the general network, into the general outreach as well. So if we're looking just at the outreach who receives this information in the end, it's fairer as well. What is less intuitive is to see that they can actually get more nodes in the outreach than if you're being agnostic. So it can be more efficient overall. And we can get a condition for that when you have a budget that's large enough, when your campaign can be big enough. So that the, the model that we're using here is really helpful in, in allowing us to compute a condition for the size of the campaign. And it shows us that for a small campaign, agnostic seating performs the best. For a large campaign, parity seating can perform better than agnostic. And for a medium one, it's diversity seating that's doing the best. So I, just to show you some quick results to, to give us a numerical sense of what do these results actually mean. Um, this is a, a, a graph in which we're looking at the seat set size on the x-axis and, um, and on the y-axis, we're looking at the total outreach. This is from a, a network that's simulated from about 50,000 nodes is similar to a real network that we're gonna, uh, that we, we tested our results on as well with two communities. And we show that um, as the number of seeds increase, as your, as your campaign basically increases, that's when your outreach gets better for diversity and for parity seeding. So to give a sense of how this phase transition actually happens, I want to show you very quickly this graph. I hope I'm, I'm good with time. Um, and in this one, what happens is the following. You again have the same network. It's a simulated network of about 50,000 nodes with two communities. And in the, in the, in the here in the x-axis is how unequal the network is. So for 0 0.10, the minority fraction is 10%. You have 10% red nodes, 90% blue nodes. As you're moving towards the right on the x-axis, you get to a more equal network in which the minority fraction gets to 45%. On the y-axis is again, the seat set size. So your campaign size. So, well, and, and the colors here are whichever algorithm is getting you um, the, the more than agnostic in, um, in, in, in outreach. So for the orange region, being agnostic, is performing the best. You're going to have a trade-off between being fair and being efficient. So diversity is always doing better than parity because it's a relaxed version of it. But at some point, as you increase the seat set size, we get into the blue region in which being diverse actually gets you more nodes in your outreach overall. And that's interesting. And we see that as the network gets more equal, as we move to the right on the x-axis, the we need fewer and fewer nodes in the seat set size for this to be the case. So it's much e easier for equal networks to be diverse and to reach this fairness condition in, in your outreach as well using the early adopters. Um, but it's much harder for networks that are unequal. And similarly, if, if you're moving to a very large campaign size, the, that's when parity seeding, when you have a strict condition on parity, also starts to perform better. So you get more nodes in, 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 the, uh, in the outreach as well than agnostic. And you need a lot more nodes for a strict condition of fairness to be able to, 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 be able to do better, but it is achievable. And this is the, the kind of analysis that allows us to see where these trade-offs occur. And to, and to reason about what are the different elements that allow us to be more fair 
whether that's our budget or the assumptions that we're, we're implementing in this, in this model. Um, and when does it come at a trade-off? The trade-off in this particular case is not very large, um, but when we have a very small campaign, it exists, is there. So a quick note about, I wanna relate this to a different project that looks like at, at the recommendation algorithms. And the connection is the, the, the similar model that we're using that, that tries to model this inequality between different communities. So if you're looking at recommendations that are based on your friends of friends, you're trying to connect with people who are within your network. So whether you can do that through an algorithm like Adamic Adar, which simply creates a score between pairs of vertices, or you're doing a random walk of length two. What we find is that inequality in, in, the, in a network can get amplified. And we see this on a case study on, on both on a theoretical model, but also on a data set from Instagram, where we see that we have a degree imbalance between two communities, in our case, men and women, and more than that, we notice this kind of glass ceiling effect. So if you're looking at people who have very, very high number of connections here have degree at least 10, these are among the top 1% people in the network. Um, although the men are a minority in this network, they actually get, uh, they get the, the most of this high degree. So they are overrepresented at the very top of the network. And through a recommendation algorithm that we simulate on this network, um, we get that this gets amplified. What is interesting about this data set is that we got it, it's from, from, from quite a few years ago, from I think 2013, has about half a million nodes, um, so people, and it was gathered before Instagram implemented their, their uh, who to connect to feature. So one assumption we can make in here is that these connections that exist are just organic. They're not influenced by in, in, in a recommendation algorithm. So when we simulate them on this particular network, we see this kind of difference and we see the effect of an algorithm. Um, we see this through the, the model is really helpful for us to understand this. So if we're looking at the model that I showed you before with preferential attachment and homophily, that models this organic growth of a network. And if you're adding a recommendation to that kind of model, we're really able to, to compute how the new degree distribution would look like. And the effect that we see is that we, we saw that there's, there's an the imbalance in the organic growth in the coefficients of these degree distributions of the power law. And what we see is that recommendation makes this gap even wider. And that shows us what we see in the data that um, inequality that was present in the network simply gets amplified through looking at friends of friends. And through looking at the, 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 this kind of modeling choices of people having and being in different communities and connecting more with popular people and with more with people who are similar to them. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm close to being done. I wanted to finish up with a few open questions regarding this, that the, the, there's a lot of work in trying to understand bias and inequality in this kind of networks. And um, there's no model that is really, really, uh, the panacea for all of this. So we've been working a lot with trying to understand what are the elements of, of these that are important to model in this kind of questions. And I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, there's other open questions that are more general related to, the, to, to tackling fairness and algorithmic bias. So when does awareness of demographics and sensitive features help? It did help in the case of information diffusion because what it basically did was to, to, to find communities that didn't receive that information yet. So by centering those, now they receive the information which makes the system more efficient and it makes it more fair because they're not left out of the loop. Um, so how do we redesign algorithms that are more equitable? That's a final question that relates to how do we navigate this potential fairness efficiency trade-off that we see when, when we think about fairness as a constraint and how can we move away from this, this view and thinking about centering uh, the communities and individuals that are, that are central to our system. So that's all I had for this presentation. Thank you so much.
I'm looking forward for your questions and you can contact me at any point if you have further thoughts. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, my suggestion is that we leave the questions because many of the questions, there might be specific technical questions about your presentation, but there are also questions that will relate to Salon's talk. So, so maybe we, we just move to Salon's talk, but I, I just wanna mention one thing where, while Salon is, is uh, sharing his screen, that not only Anna just presented a fantastic scientific topic, but she's also one of the leaders in the data science for social good. And, oh, and, and, yeah. and, 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 and Salon is one of the leaders in, in fairness. Uh, he, he actually wrote the book in fairness, which is a fantastic book. And, and if, I'm hope I'm not embarrassing them by saying this, but this area is one of the areas that for us that have been a, a, in academia for a long time, it's a pleasure to see an area that is completely or almost completely led by the young generation. So um, it's not a chance that we have uh, two very young scientists presenting in this talk, because it's really a lot of the a, a fairness a, and, and explainability and social good is actually led by the young generation of graduate students, assistant professors. So, so as educators should make us very proud that this is the generation that is taking data science and machine learning to improve society. And we are kind of sitting in the back and just watching them uh, grow and, and growing them watching them educate us. So, so uh, uh, as educators, uh, we are very proud of this generation and both uh, Anna and Soron are, are excellent representatives of uh, what we have big hope because they are leaders and they, they don't only talk the talk, but they walk the walk. So uh, Solon, now it's on you. And I really hope I didn't embarrass. I just say what, what I really believe when I, when I read your papers are, are just fantastic to see the young generation leading here. So Thank let's you. just do the same. We are gonna to listen to Solon and then we open for, for questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Guillermo. Um, that's an un unbelievably kind introduction. Um, I really appreciate the, the, the generous uh, words and I'm really pleased to be able to speak with you folks and to be in the company of Anna, whose presentation I really enjoyed. And I, I have lots of questions of my own, so I look forward to the discussion. Um, so I'm going to present some work. I hope you can see my slides clearly. Um, is, is that coming through okay? Great, okay. Uh, let me just make sure I can advance. Yeah, great, okay. So I'm gonna present some work, joint work um, with Andrew Supps, who's a legal scholar, a law professor at UCLA, and Manish Raghavan, who is a computer science doctoral student at Cornell. Um, this is work in the area of interpretability and explainability. Um, and um, I'm hoping that this will be of some relevance to the topic of the workshop, um, in part because a lot of these concerns have cropped up in the law and policy domain over the past few years, largely because of things like deep learning. Um, so these more sophisticated learning methods, which produce models that are often perceived as inscrutable. Um, <clears throat> And so what I'll discuss today are some methods that have achieved some traction within the technical community for explaining these models and their decisions, but also seem particularly appealing to folks who work in law and policy because they seem to offer some desirable properties when you have normative or policy goals. Um, and in particular, what we try to do in this work is try to excavate some of the assumptions behind the techniques uh, that have become particularly popular and try to point out some limitations, but also some ways to maybe address those limitations. Um, so what I'll be focusing on today is what we call feature highlighting explanations. Um, for those of you who follow this literature, um, this, is, this encompasses what uh, are known as counterfactual explanations, which you can think of as um, trying to find uh, the kind of minimal perturbance you would have to make to the input data to achieve a different classification from the model. Um, but there's something similar actually, a similar kind of notion within existing law in the United States uh, that governs credit decision-making um, where lenders and other people who are using credit uh, file information to make decisions actually need to give explanations for adverse decisions. So that's when they reject an applicant or maybe give them a higher interest rate. Um, 
And there too, the style of explanation that the regulation calls for is not disclosure of the model, but instead kind of focusing on specific features that account for the adverse outcome. Um, and so in particular, you should think of this as sort of a sparse explanation, right? It's not the full set of features that the model considers. It's by design meant to be a small subset. It is not uh, the model in its entirety, right? We're actually getting um, a, a set of features, not actually anything about the model itself. Um, and as a result, um, this seems to actually provide a lot of the kind of demand, satisfy a lot of the demand you might have for explanation while circumventing some of the concerns that people have that might come from full model disclosure and things like that. And in fact, um, I would say that regulators sort of embraced this proposal recently because it seemed almost like a silver bullet. Um, for those who've, again, been following some of these discussions within uh, the machine learning world, a few years ago, there was a paper that made quite a splash, which seems to suggest that these legal requirements for explanation might actually just directly con uh, stand in conflict with more sophisticated learning methods because the thinking at the time was that the model would have to be interpretable in order for the model to meet the legal requirements. Um, and so there was sort of a hard conflict between things like deep learning um, and these legal obligations. Um, but some of these new methods like counterfactual explanations seem very uh, attractive because they would not place any constraints on model complexity. The model could be arbitrarily complex so long as you're able to generate these explanations, right? And so this seemed like a very nice way to escape the trade-off. It also seemed to address some uh, concerns that business had, which would be around intellectual property. So not wanting to disclose the model because for example, credit scoring models are the, the kind of bread and butter of a lot of these companies um, and potentially also limit gaming. So make it more difficult to, for people to engage in strategic manipulation. Likewise, uh, these kinds of explanations were seen as being more helpful. They provide people with a justification, a meaningful justification for some adverse decision, or maybe even instructions for how to achieve a different outcome. So, you know, this potentially is much more useful than overwhelming someone with a full model. You're actually giving them a kind of purposely sparse, discrete set of uh, explanations. Um, or you're even saying in the, in, the, in the case of counterfactual explanations, which I'll talk about in more detail, the exact amount that that particular feature would have to change in order for you to get the desired outcome. Um, and that this would be automated, that there would be no you know, human involved in this process. You can generate these explanations on the fly. And as I'll explain in some detail, it also seems that these techniques seem to comply with the law. And so it was very exciting to think that um, some developments within the technical community allowed us to achieve um, a lot of the goals of law and policy without placing a bunch of restrictions uh, on, on model complexity and all these other concerns that you have here. Um, but what I'll try to spend the rest of the time talking about is that there's a significant amount of subjective choice that goes into the use of these techniques that is often conveniently overlooked when people are advocating for these, these types of explanations. And that really depending on the way that you make these choices or the assumptions that you make along the way, can have like enormous practical effect on how useful these kinds of explanations will be. And in particular, have really serious implications for the autonomy of the people who receive those explanations. And by autonomy, I mean the ability for people to make kind of informed, rational decisions for themselves. Let me actually quickly discuss some of the legal requirements for explanation before I then turn back to some of the assumptions that we're trying to unearth. And I'll be, I'll, I'll be pretty brief here because I could say a lot, but uh, it would probably eat up all the time. Um, so as I mentioned, um, there was this concern a few years ago about there being a, a strict tension between the legal, ex the legal requirements for explanation and model complexity. And largely that was focused on the European General Data Protection Regulation. So this is um, a kind of omnibus privacy regulation in Europe, um, which includes language which seems to kind of get at the idea that there is a, um, an expectation that people will receive an explanation for automated decisions. And there's a huge amount to say here because it's a it's a fairly contested idea. Um, but I think it's fair to say that at a minimum, uh, a body, this is the Article, Article 29 Working Party, which has been replaced by a more formal body the past year, but generally think of this as being a coalition of the authorities within each EU member state who are experts on data protection, issuing kind of their collective interpretation of the law. And what they've said is that really at a minimum, you should interpret the GDPR to have a requirement that there be an explanation of specific decisions, which notably is different than saying that the model itself needs to be interpretable or that the model needs to be disclosed. 
Instead, it says that the explanation has to be of the decision of the, of the kind of model outcome. Um, and so there's been a lot of interest in trying to use specifically counterfactual explanations to satisfy this requirement. But as, as I said, there are also legal requirements in the US around credit laws, which have their own uh, requirement for explanation. And here, those are things called uh, adverse action notices. When I've given talks about this in the past, I often would ask the audience, you know, who's ever received one of these adverse action notices? And of course, no one responds because this only happens if you apply for credit and are rejected. So no one wants to kind of volunteer that they've had that experience. Um, but if in fact you have, uh, what you might know is that you receive this kind of list of factors that explain why you've been rejected. Um, and the law is actually quite specific. It says that no factor that was a principal reason for the adverse action may be excluded. So you actually have to include the real reason for why you rejected the person. Um, and it has to be the real reason. It can't be some proxy for the actual feature that was in the model. It has to be the actual feature that directly explains the adverse decision. Um, but notably, the regulation also points out that it should be probably no more than four reasons. Um, so there's a kind of sparsity expectation, probably because there's a sense that if you actually include this very long list of, of reasons, it would become much less useful. And so you might see that there's some kind of surprising similarity between what is asked for in the law and what actually counterfactual explanations by design are trying to do. The thing I just wanted to note is that this legal requirement is over 40 years old. So lenders have had to comply with this for a very long time, well before there were you know, much more sophisticated learning methods, um, and well before there was any notion of using these kind of counterfactual explanation methods. Um, and the, there's a guidance about the regulation that kind of points out you know, what might these explanations include. And so examples in, include things like you know, th things that are actually like almost not really what you would think of as being relevant to the model, but lack of information that's necessary to even make a judgment, right? We don't have your income. Um, but other things are much more similar to what you might expect in a counterfactual explanation, like the length of employment, how long you've been on the job. Um, and these are all typical examples of what might be included in an adverse action notice. But this is the part I wanna focus on, um, which is the, the kind of interpretation of how to satisfy this, this requirement. And, in, and if you read this, I'll read it out loud, you'll see that it's actually quite strange and actually quite different than a counterfactual ex explanation. So what they say is one method is to identify the factors for which the applicant score fell furthest below the average score for each of those factors achieved by the applicants whose total score was at or slightly above the minimum passing score. Another method is to identify the factors for which the applicant score fell furthest below the average score for each of those factors achieved by all applicants. So this is quite interesting, which is basically saying that is like, you want to imagine that, you know, along each dimension, the average score that that feature takes in the population, how far is that person, the particular person who applied from that score, that average score for the entire population. And it's actually the feature where the person is furthest, furthest away, right? That you actually want to then use that feature as part of your explanation. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this is almost the opposite or like the kind of converse of what you have in counterfactual explanations, where the goal is to focus on those things which are sort of easiest or in some sense closest to the boundary. And so this is very different in practice from what is actually done in counterfactual explanations. It's interesting in talking to regulators and people in industry, it's not super clear how many people follow this method, but this is what's proposed formally and the guidance from the regulator. Um, and it's actually interesting to think about why this might be quite different than what people on counterfactual, doing work on counterfactual explanations might be, might be doing. And so in our work, um, we actually try to kind of give a charitable reading for this principal reason approach, this the approach promoted in the US credit laws. Um, and you can think of it as basically being something that's focused on some notion of procedural justice, right? So the way to respect the autonomy of the, the decision subject, the person applying for the loan, is to tell the person which factors were sort of most held against her, regardless of the fact that they can't really do anything about it, right? That, you know, they would have to change that feature by a tremendous amount in order to get to the other side of the decision boundary. Um, and so knowing that somehow is actually more respectful. Whereas in counterfactual explanations, you could think of it as a focus on agency, telling people what they would be able to do most easily in order to effectively achieve their goals. Um, and it's not that one of these is right and the other one is wrong, it's that there's slightly different ideas of how to respect autonomy. Um, and in, in practice, you can imagine doing both. 
Um, whichever method you happen to choose, though, there are going to be a number of assumptions you have to make along the way. Um, and what I'll now focus on are, are some of the challenges that come along with making those assumptions. And again, to stress, this would be true whether or not you're focusing on the kind of approach that's advocated for in US credit laws or in these counterfactual explanation techniques. OK. So one is that when we disclose these features um, as the reason for some particular outcome, um, there's often a sense where that, that uh, telling the person that this is the feature that they would have to change is the equivalent of telling them that this is the action that they would need to take in order to get a different outcome. But in practice, this is not always exactly the same thing. In fact, you can imagine many ways in which people don't even really know how to change the feature that is being offered as a reason for the adverse decision. Um, and we often rely on domain knowledge to make a mapping between what feature is offered as a reason for the decision and the actions we would have to take in the real world to change that feature, right? Like, you know, we actually have to some sense of like, okay, if you're holding up this feature, what actions can I take in the world that would causally affect the value of that feature? And that's not really understood necessarily uh, intuitively by the explanation, it's something that you re rely on domain knowledge to fill in. And likewise, um, the available actions that we might have to change certain features might not sort of nicely line up uh, with a discrete feature. Um, in fact, many actions that are available to us can affect multiple features at the same time. So for example, um, you could imagine uh, a reason you would get for an adverse credit decision is that you had insufficient income. And so you have to increase your income in order to get the favorable outcome. Um, but here you can imagine two possible actions to do that. So one might be uh, to get a new job. Um, but as you see my little model over here, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, you know, the model could very well also take into account not just your income, but also length of employment. Okay. And getting a new job means that yes, you potentially get a higher salary, but it simultaneously affects your length of employment. Okay. So it, that's point one here on the little plot or the graph. Um, versus this other action you might take, which is to say, simply stay at your current job and wait for a raise, right? So uh, length of employment also increases, but so too does your, you know, your income at some point. Um, and what this is trying to point out is that, you know, while you're given these explanations that say, take this, uh, change this value and feature, the actions available to you in the real world don't nicely and in isolation map to those features. They often affect more than one at the same time. Um, and there's been some thinking more generally in the work that's been done on explanation um, um, around actionable explanations. So the hope that when we give people explanations that they are focused on those things where people can actually take meaningful actions in the real world to change them. So this is sort of saying, don't tell people things where they could do nothing to actually change the outcome. Focus on those features where there is real opportunity for people to, to make change and then uh, achieve the goal they have from the model. Um, and I think what this reflects is that in order to really even know what is actionable in the real world, right? So to kind of limit your explanation to features over which people have some control, you actually need to have some notion of like, what are the available causal mechanisms in the world that affect those features? Um, and this is often done in a pretty hand wavy way where we say we'll rely on some domain knowledge to help select among the available features in the model to limit it to those that are only those um, where people can have some influence. Um, but this really requires actually understanding the nature of the relationship between actions and features. Um, and this is not something that is available to the model. This requires external knowledge, right? And so the available techniques we have for generating these explanations will never really be able to do this without this additional information, without the assumptions we might make about what is available for people to change. Okay. The second point we make is that, um, you know, here again, we're looking at trying to provide a sparse set of features um, that are relevant to the, to the outcome. Um, and how do you then decide which are the most important? Um, and how in particular do you actually compare features that might be incommensurate, right? You know, these are not naturally on the same scale. Um, these are often very different types of things like length of employment versus uh, income are not sort of not naturally commensurate things. Um, so within the existing literature, one way of doing this is, is to rely on some, some style of normalization techniques where you want to put everything on the same numerical scale, which makes sense. 
And from a purely mathematical perspective, that's useful. But that doesn't really get at the true difference in how easy or difficult things are going to be to change in the real world, right? Uh, what is the actual cost involved in making the changes uh, for one feature versus another? Um, again, this is not something that's well represented in the data. This is something that's often highly dependent on the real world constraints that people face. Um, and in fact, this is not something that's just different by feature. Often the cost involved in making changes will be different per person, right? What might be easy for me to change, some feature that might be easy for me to change might be very difficult for someone else to change. And that's not going to be something that is encoded in the data that then gets integrated into the decision about which features to offer in the explanation. Um, and scaling, right, the choice of how we scale can very easily flip the kinds of features we ultimately decide to highlight in these explanations. And so this question about how do we normalize or how do we scale is paramount. Um, and often this is done by just looking at the distribution of the data, when in fact, what we probably almost always care about is cost. And that is not information that is available to the people who are being asked to made, make these decisions. Um, um, right, and so as I was saying, this cost just varies tremendously by circumstance and by, by, by person. Um, and, and, and that these uh, methods are sort of indifferent to that. And this, uh, to, to us, I think is probably one of the most fundamental problems of this process, especially given that it's proposed as a method to kind of help people figure out the easiest thing to do, or in the case of the counter, the, the US credit law is the most difficult, right? Both of these things kind of don't make sense ultimately, unless you have some more robust notion of cost. Um, the third thing we point out is that um, the features that are going to be highlighted in these explanations are often relevant to more than the decision that that particular decision maker is in the process of making, right? So like my income, is relevant to decisions, not just with respect to credit, but probably many other goals I have in my life, okay? Um, and so when you choose to tell someone to change this particular feature, um, it's often an explanation that doesn't take into account the many other reasons why a person might not want to make that change because they have other goals where that feature is also relevant, right? So for example, a change in feature might benefit this, you know, might, be might benefit one person in this domain while hurting them in another, or the opposite, right? So it might be that a change in feature benefits the subject in multiple domains, right? So it's rational for me to invest in change in this feature, not because it's only useful with respect to credit, but it's also rational with respect to many other goals I might have. And this becomes very clear in some of the arguments that people have developed over the past few years where like, you really wanna avoid telling people to do irrational or harmful things, right? So the example people have often given is that like there may be credit models where for some reason, in some part of the space, it might make sense for people to make less money uh, in order to get the decision they want, right? But people quite reasonably point out that this is not the explanation you wanna give, even if it's true, because that's just irrational, right? No one really should be told the best way to get credit is to make less money. Um, and I think another way to interpret that is that, you know, it may be rational if your only goal is to get the decision you want from this model, but it's clearly irrational when you consider that income is something that's relevant to many other goals you have in, my, in your life. Right? Um, and again, then deciding which feature is the right one to highlight among the many that you could choose between um, becomes a lot more difficult when you recognize that these features figure or play a role in many other decisions that are made about you across your life. And so, you know, you might think of this as, as a, a task of trying to figure out how to avoid these negative spillovers, right? You want to not encourage people to do things that will be harmful in other domains. And you want to seek out these cases where you can have positive spillover, where, you know, focus on those features where encouraging people to make changes has positive benefits elsewhere. Um, but in the, in the end, because this information is not available to the decision maker, uh, they will have to make certain decisions about this, or maybe they don't even think about it at all. Um, and so this is not actually taken into consideration. Um, and the very last point I would say is that like, um, these methods also don't really think about the fact that people might have other reasons besides the one that your decision, that your model is focused on um, to change features that are just not disclosed, right? So I say to you, the reason you're getting credit are the following two reasons. But of course the model considers many other reasons, right? They, do, they just happen to not be disclosed to you because they're not seen as particularly relevant. Um, you might decide that like, well, then these other reasons are irrelevant. And so I should feel free to totally change those other factors because they're not gonna affect my decision.
But of course, the explanation you receive depends on the stability of those features, right? Those things that are not disclosed to you remaining the same. Um, and again, there could be many other reasons besides wanting to get credit, for example, that you change these other features, but that's not considered in the explanation that we're given. Okay. Um, we then talk about a few properties that, about the model that is often assumed. So there's certain ideas of, you know, what do these models look like when we apply these uh, methods? And the one that I'll just focus on here is that um, much of this falls apart if the model is not monotonic, right? So um, if it's very possible, and of course, if we're talking about deep learning models, that's very possible, right? Um, and so what you can imagine is saying like increase your income, okay? Or spend more time on your job. Um, but if it turns out that if you spend too much time in the same job, that it begins to actually be a mark against you, right? It, it shows that you're stagnating at your job, let's say. And so actually maybe it's a signal that you're not a good credit risk. Um, then it's possible that in telling someone to increase their length of employment can be helpful for some amount of time, but then at some point actually begins to hurt you. And you would think intuitively receiving an explanation like that suggests to people that like any movement in that direction will always be helpful, right? And so to the extent that there isn't this monotonicity uh, constraint, you can imagine people either undershooting or overshooting their mark and actually finding themselves in a worse position. And so there's just certain assumptions about the model that are often made that are not really discussed nearly as much as they should be. There's others that I won't go into for the sake of time. Um, I have, let's see, there's more I'll discuss, but I'm a little wary of time. Guillermo, can I ask you how I'm doing on time? A, a, a few more minutes, is that okay. okay? And then you can bring those on the discussion as well, if you, yeah. Yeah, I can actually do the next few slides pretty quickly. Okay, so um, having kind of gone through all these challenges, um, we then point out some tensions, right? And in particular, the one that we want to emphasize the most is like, it's not to say that despite these problems, there's some obviously better alternative, right? The whole point is that like, actually we're using these methods or we find them attractive um, because there isn't really some obviously uh, more attractive alternative, right? So um, is the alternative to just disclose the model its entirety, right? Is the point to just have, the, have access to the model directly? And of course, if we're dealing with very complex models, deep learning models, you know, everyday people, lay people will find that completely unhelpful. There is no world in which uh, having direct access to a deep learning model, if you're an everyday person, could possibly be helpful, right? And so there isn't some, you know, this isn't an argument in favor of just disclosing the model. Instead, what I think this points out is that like, we actually need to make certain assumptions in order to serve the autonomy of people. And in some ways, what we might be concerned with is that the people making those assumptions are compromising people's autonomy because they're making the assumptions for people um, but there's no, uh, there's no way out of this, right? There has to be some assumptions made in order to facilitate people's informed decision-making. Um, and here, what we can think about is that there are other domains, this is often the case, right? So fiduciaries like your lawyer um, or even your financial advisor are people who understand things that you don't and need to make decisions about how to explain things to you with your best interests in mind, right? And so you can think of a similar obligation here, right? Um, given the latitude that people have when making, when using these techniques, um, you want to make sure that they're doing it with best efforts with your interest in mind, right? Can I learn about you enough to try to really adapt this explanation to best serve your interests? And in doing that, um, it can be autonomy enhancing, right? It's not disclosing the full details can actually be a way of making people more able to realize their goals. Um, of course, having said that, um, what we were trying to emphasize when going through all these assumptions is that, you know, these styles of explanation give a tremendous amount of latitude to decision makers about how to explain things, right? And so when you talk to regulators, they're often concerned with fidelity. Are the explanations that are being given accurate? Um, and what I've been trying to tell them is that, like, there's an infinite number of explanations that might be accurate. But that's not the problem. The problem is that many different types of explanations could be more or less useful depending on your policy goals, right? So it's not, I think, a concern about whether those explanations are faithful to the model. It's whether those explanations serve the interests of the people that they are being offered to. And so you could imagine explanations that are correct, but are really just a way of kind of advancing the interest of the decision maker, not of the people subject to the decision, right? I'm going to give you the explanation that steers you toward the loan that is gonna make me the most money, not the loan that you might want to get, right? And there's nothing inherent to these explanation methods that 
force the decision makers to kind of focus on the interests of the decision subjects, they can often advance their own interests. And so again, this is yet another reason to think about fiduciary obligation. And the very final point, which is maybe obvious, is that you know, one way of overcoming some of these assumptions is to you know, give a much more diverse set of explanations, allow people to point out when they don't find the explanation helpful, um, allow people to maybe give input so that they can uh, you know, restructure the decision-making process, uh, the explanation process, and so on. Um, and there's a lot of work on this front, and a lot of it I think is very promising. And you can imagine these things actually working in concert. The question is, at what point does this actually then also make it possible to reconstruct the model? And so this is the tension that had attracted people to these kinds of explanations in the first place, right? You don't want the model to be disclosed. You want to protect it. And to the extent that we give more explanations or allow people to actually um, kind of tinker with inputs to see what the model would do, um, we're getting closer and closer maybe to the ability to reconstruct the model. And so we have to then think about where there are limits to this and how those concerns might ultimately um, make people reluctant to adopt them. Um, okay, so I'll stop there. There's some pathway, like it's kind of future directions I think that could be helpful, but um, I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. So thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Salon. And, and I think both of you, you and Anna, proved me right that, that you guys are leading a, a, thanks, Anna, also for a, a pointing the website for the mechanism design for social good that I briefly mentioned. They, they also host a, a very good a, a, a talks a, a Friday. They, we are actually missing the one at, at noon. So, Anna, if you're there, if you could just uh, reopen your, your camera. Thanks. Uh, I want to start while others are warming up with a question. Before that, I just want to mention a comment, Salon, that you mentioned a lot the legal, but I was doing a parallel your presentation about the medical. In the medical, many diseases have a genetic and an environmental. There is nothing you can do with your genetics. I mean, you can't change your father and mother. Uh, so heart conditions, for example, have a genetic component and environmental. And if you tell me that I'm prone to a heart attack because my father had one, what can I do? But if you tell me that because I'm not having a proper diet, it, then I might be able. So there is a parallel uh, with, with medical conditions. I want to raise a question open to the community, but both of you that indirectly you touch. And, and Salon, you talk about the, the stability of the features. And Anna, you talk about, you know, you're thinking you're doing good and then the, pro the, the model propagates and becomes even more biased than, than you thought. And I want to raise the question, what happened when we, re re we really, so basically life doesn't know what fair is. And I'm not talking that we don't have access to the demographics. Uh, let me just give you an example to ground this on also on the medical. There are some diseases that we know that there is a disparity between male and female, that males are more prone than female. For example, autism is one of those. But we actually don't know the exact ratio. Science doesn't know it. So how I design a fair system, let's say, for diagnosis, when my target is actually not known? If at all, or my target might be changing in time. That let's say that I design it to be two to one, and then science show me that actually two and a half to one is the right. So, so how do I deal with life that has uncertainty? So, either one of you, both of you, or or anybody that is listening to you to this, but maybe following the order of the presentation, maybe Anna. Any thoughts you have about that? Yeah, no, I, I think this is a really good question. I, 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 we think a lot about this of how can we make sure we keep up with the changing features or with features or, or with this kind of goals that are perhaps unknown. So there is a question you hear of like, how do you measure what's the goal or whether you're achieving something that you're aiming for or whether that's something that's changing to even like add to that uh, and related to what Solomon was saying, Maybe sometimes they're trying to achieve a certain goal that's fair, but then because of that, because when, when you achieve it, things are changing or people respond to it and then you have to change it again. So I, there, there's been some work, not too much from what I've seen on like trying to do to make these algorithms have this online component. 
Um, but the, the main question I think relates to, do we even know what's the, what's the important goal we're trying to achieve? And are these statistical measurements the enough or is it something we're missing by imposing them? Um, I, think, I think it's more of an open question and I, I'm not sure exactly what would be uh, a, a better answer for that. But Solon, if you have any other thoughts too. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I have a slightly different perspective on this, which is um, a lot of fairness issues actually originate from like the improper, well, I wouldn't say improper, from the choice about how to formulate the problem, um, right? So uh, choosing like the target variable often like sets you on a very particular path where it may very well raise quite different issues depending on how you formulated the problem in the first place. So um, I've looked a little bit at that in the case of credit scoring, but there's a paper that rightfully got a lot of attention looking at um, how a model that was used to target uh, like medical support to people who are likely to have like, you know, who, who are thought to benefit the most from additional support uh, with their health ended up exhibiting racial bias in the sense that the target that was chosen as like, a, you know, what at first might have thought seemed like a reasonable proxy uh, was healthcare costs, right? So like who are the people who are gonna be expensive because they're gonna utilize the healthcare system a lot and we should direct our resources there um, and what this points out um, is that there are severe healthcare disparities that are explained by not health, but instead socioeconomic factors that explain like who ends up actually costing more. And so, um, you know, black patients of equivalent health actually cost much less uh, because of complex, again, socioeconomic factors. Um, and so if we had set up the problem slightly differently, if we had sort of thought like the goal here is to like ensure that we get the most improved health for our budget, right? Uh, and we wanna allocate resources that way, you would have had a very different, a different problem, a very different model. The model would have exhibited very different fairness properties. And so I think there are interesting questions here too about like when I'm thinking about fairness, maybe it actually makes sense to really start at the most basic question of all, which is like, what is the problem you're solving, right? Like how should we formulate this in a way that is thoughtful, but also sort of takes into consideration that when we make these kind of choices of convenience about proxies, um, that we may be actually putting ourselves in a very dangerous path. So, so that let me just do a follow up, and and so I'm I'm looking at the uh, the name of the great organization that Anna is part, Mechanism Design for Social Good. And I wonder, should it be called Mechanism Design to inform social good? Because at what point, if, as, as Salon was saying, if, if we start from the wrong problem, so, so what's actually the function of data scientists that are listening to this talk is should we design the algorithms or should we design algorithms that we can inform and we can work together with the people that are making decisions because there is multiple, and as Solon was saying in his talk, sometimes contradictory, uh, my health might not be for the benefit of the insurance companies. So, so how do you see the function and the interaction and, and Solon, you know, your co-author is a legal scholar uh, uh, how do you see the interaction that we have with the people that are at the end are making the decisions here? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy you brought this up. We had a really uh, amazing talk by Matt Weinberg today at MD4SG. And he talked a lot about this, about like, how do we even define this problem? He was working through our group about a problem of how you model um, healthcare providers in a free market setting and about how much he had to like discuss with domain experts, experts to go back and forth on the very, very basis of the model to even define what the problem is. And I think a lot of the work we, we, we're doing really reflects that to like really try to define the problem that oftentimes we define it from a very like, you know, if I'm coming from computer science, it's gonna be like a more computer science problem. And it's often missing those socioeconomic aspects uh, of, of, a, of a larger system that Solon is talking about. So it's really important to like have this, these meaningful interactions with people who can tell us where your model doesn't really include that or your, your definition didn't really include this other part. I think there's still, of course, much value to the, to the formalization that I think theory can bring just to highlight some of the some of the uh, contradictions that may appear uh, from having different visions on what fairness could be, 
or to provide like a diagnosis on what issues could 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 appear. And yeah, I, I don't see it as a way to just like solve, you know, the problem of like healthcare or credit score. It's more like an informative tool that really, really needs the input of someone coming from as a domain expert to tell us where the model is wrong and what else can we do to improve it. And oftentimes we see that we see a struggle in defining a model that's for that's working for which we can develop some tools to understand it, but it's also not terrible in terms of the application that we're trying to use it for. Yeah, great point, Salon. I'll just say some, a few quick things. So it's interesting because this adverse action notice requirement, which is you know, when you apply for a loan and you get rejected and they have to give you some explanation. One of the motivations actually was to help point out the kind of factors that were marked against you so that people could go check if those were actually accurate, right? In the sense of like, oh, you were making this decision on inaccurate information, right? My credit file was out of date or there was something wrong here. And so it's interesting to reflect on that, right? There's a sort of recognition that these institutions using automated tools can make mistakes and we're trying to integrate some method that allows people to point out when there are mistakes. Um, what I have found really interesting about this area though is that there doesn't seem to be any empirical work. Like, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, of time and resources devoted to generating these explanations. But as far as I know, there's very little that's been at least published that shows that they're effective in their goal. Um, and I would really like to understand, for example, like how well served are people by these notices they receive from, from lenders. Um, and you can imagine this also being like a, something to, to investigate from the lender's perspective as well, right? Um, to some degree, they have incentives to do a good job. Maybe they want people to figure out how to become more credit worthy so that they can actually get their business. Um, but some, in some cases, they, they, they might find it as just like a kind of legal compliance issue, right? Like I just wanna satisfy the requirement and not do anything else. Are they actually experimenting? Are they trying to figure out how to do this any better? Or are they trying to just meet the minimum requirement um, and, and that's it? And so I think there's really interesting empirical questions to investigate um, to see whether some of these ways of allowing people to kind of point out when the system is not working as it should, or to adapt their behavior in ways that serve the goals of different stakeholders, whether these, whether these like methods actually serve those purposes. So, yeah. That's a, that's a great point. And that raises the point that behavioral economics is very important here because the fact that you tell me something, even if I can change, that doesn't mean I will change. And we, we had that experience in our group that for certain diseases, you actually tell them you need to come to see the doctor because you have a high probability of having A and they don't come because we present the information potentially in the wrong way. I'm gonna open while people are, are, are getting a, the courage to ask the, both of you questions. I'm just gonna mention something that came to my mind on, on one of the comments that Salon mentioned, and I encourage everybody to do it. If, if the first time I bought a house, I got my credit score like two points below the maximum, uh, which doesn't affect your credit. But I was very curious. Uh, I'm a scientist. I wanted to know why I lost two points. So I called and they have to tell me. And they told me uh, that I lost two points because I always pay my bills on time. So the system never tested me when I'm late paying my bills. So they don't have knowledge about my behavior when I'm late paying a bill and I lost two points for that or three points, I don't remember. And this is one of the cases, I'm not gonna start paying late so I can increase my score uh, uh, because the, 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 but it makes no sense from my perspective, it makes sense from their perspective because they wanna measure how good I am at paying my debts when they're late. Mm -hmm. and, and it's one of those examples that you just gave me non-actionable information that doesn't really help me in, yeah. in any form or fashion, but they probably were mandated by law to explain that to me. And, and I probably was the first person in the planet that called them for those two points, but I wanted a perfect score. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, so so uh, uh, anyway, and. Uh, 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 
if, and I, I just want to open a bit the, the, the people on YouTube. If you need to ask a question, you need to come down to the earth of Zoom. If I do have additional questions, but, if, but I want to just open the forum. I might call on some of you because I know many of the people in the audience. So, and I know that you have questions. So let me, if, when you have a question, if you can open your camera. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Guillermo, this is E. Yes, E, please. I just want to make a, a sort of collect the, uh, I, I think it's so long and also, um, and Anna had all this uh, domain uh, application really point a very important question, right? Even related to the previous uh, session about robustness is that many of the social or legal or medical will really need uh, uh, the, the either explain to a policymaker or the patient or the, um, the, the, the people we serve, the explanation, you know, human, probably we are causal animals, right? We, we want to know the cause. I mean, not necessarily the explanation has to be correct, but it has to be, uh, to some extent in a social context has to be convincing or a scientific context has to be verifiable. And we don't have that in the current uh, deep learning, the, the current uh, framework. It's a black box. Uh, even we spend about an hour and a half just debating how to make the system robust. And of the dilemma there is we don't know what it has learned, right? So all the robustness I'm exposed to as, you know, computer scientists or, uh, or signal processing people, we know what the models are, what are the generating models. And then we want, we, we, then we know how to make it robust against such, right, open box models as well. So this is something, you know, I, I think it really this post fairness, robustness, or even um, the, 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 the privacy issues is really that you have to explain now, you know, what we can help. I mean, uh, how, how we can better as from people like me, data scientists or computational people, uh, how we can work together with people that, you know, what kind of models or computational frameworks allow us to discover the causality or the, uh, provide explanation of what the machine does uh, and connect better with those uh, different uh, specific domain, application domains. That's just, I'm just throwing the question out here for, for both, you know, probably computer scientists to also from, from people like you, uh, you know, experts from different uh, domains to, to really to how can we get together? I mean, that's also the purpose of this workshop. <laughs> I'll just say something very quickly, which is like, you know, I've often understood at least one of the motivations for explanation to be robustness, right? So the reason we want to understand what the model is doing is that we can like recognize that it has learned the wrong thing, right? It's overfits the particular example, or, you know, we have enough domain knowledge to know that the particular features that are being given some importance here have like no ca meaningful causal relationship to the outcome. And so we're not going to actually generalize well across all the domains where we want to apply the model. Um, and so there is this very tight relationship, I think, between explanation and robustness. Um, exactly. What worries me a little bit is that like, uh, it can be unprincipled, right? So we can, we can like tell these plausible causal stories given the explanations we've received that make us think like, okay, this model actually is like well-grounded. Uh, this is a reasonable basis upon which to make some decision. But it may not well be right, and then that's where I think like these causal methods then become important, right? So it's not just enough that we're able to look and maybe tell plausible stories. We might actually want to do something much more principled, where we're specifically trying to figure out causality or some causal effect. Um, and so I often think that there are times when explanation is the wrong answer uh, because it can mislead us. It can give us like confidence where it shouldn't actually be placed. Um, and that there are other methods that maybe don't result in interpretable models or maybe you know, aren't parsimonious models, but at least we have methods where we can be a bit more confident that like this is a causal effect, not just something peculiar to the training set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that's a great um, point and, and question to relate to that. And, and we are to, to relate to that, there's a lot of cases now where we see that less explainable models like black model models are being used in, in cases where it have they haven't been used before. So we see in the setting of 
um, like ad auctions, right? They're, they're now you see increasingly um, like machine learning or deep learning algorithms trying to like parse data or to do targeting in a specific way and to create this pipeline that used to be pure mechanism design with models that used to be a little bit more explainable. And now you have a component that's not that explainable. So what do you do with that? And a lot of the, the um, questions that I see around that are also centering around what's your objective and whether you're separating your objective from the impact that you're causing. Like if you're thinking about like fairness, um, if it, fairness conditions, you may want some explanations or some causality in order to integrate them well. But at the same time, you can think about designing the system with an objective that already incorporates some of that. So not including them just as a constraint, which would require you to have a much, much greater level of explanation. So I think there's something there and I see some work being, being done in that space of rethinking the objectives that we are uh, uh, implementing and together with the assumptions that we are using but and I, I yeah and I personally learn a lot from just talking to colleagues who work in, in in different fields to really understand what exactly am I looking for what kind of causal relationships am I should I even be searching for what are some models that explain that or what are some assumptions that are hiding um, or some models that are hiding assumptions from me in the way we understand how different communities operate or how the individuals respond and things like that. Yeah. So I, I'm going to follow up on E and maybe be provocative to ourselves uh, because you're working on, on, on really important challenges and working with legal scholars. You know, you mentioned the intervention of the network with HIV intervention. We everybody in this screen works in an environment that is extremely unfair, which is called academia. Uh, every step in academia is unfair, from hiring to promotion, to salaries, to almost everything. And what can we do since we are, you know, working on mechanism design and data science and fairness to help our own system to become a better system. We all know that NeurIPS, like almost every other machine learning conference, has as large randomness as quality because of the system. But we still in academia, when a new applicant like Anna will apply, we will want to see NeurIPS papers. And we will bias you if you don't have them, uh, which is wrong. So it's very hard to work with legal scholars What's your opinion about maybe not stopping to work with linear legal scholars, but also trying to make more fair our own system that we created? We have created, and, and I'm coming from the perspective of a full professor, tenure, and out chair, so I don't have a lot to lose, but we created a monster that we keep feeding that unfairness. So, and I'm if you prefer, because you're going to go into the job market and say, you don't want to and do saying. that. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but, yeah. yeah. So Anna, any thoughts about, or, or maybe you are having collaborations. How can we can yeah. change the evaluation system in academia, for example? Yeah. We, so we, we have, we're starting to have more discussions at Columbia about that, about more about how we are, we are, we are evaluating um, like students, as well as how people are evaluating assistant professor, what goes into a tenure case. Of course, I don't have any like saying that, but we are, we have had like a lot of discussions about what's important there and about how we, we are centering a lot of like volume until now, right? In a lot of the, the, this kind of systems and how can we make sure that we're incentivizing people to not only think about that and to not think about like diversity and inclusion as just something that's coming Oh, at the very least, that's something that's very hard to integrate in like a tenure case, for example, but it, if it's something that becomes more like central to someone's application, it's something that it's, it's part of your packet altogether and it's kind of trying to shift this, the, this attention to volume to other things. And I know individual people are able to, to differentiate between that. So I've had like wonderful colleagues and advisors who very much don't look at at you know volume or necessarily only where you publish but they really look at quality they look at 
uh, all the efforts you're you're putting in together. So I see, I, I do see a lot of really good effort in that. And I see this effort trying to being slowly, slowly institutionalized. Um, I think there, there's a big question of there of how we even attract more diverse candidates and how do we make sure we're not like creating these obstacles by setting some expectations that are just, they're, they're very limiting to the work that one can do. So even by being part of this organization, the MD4SG group, I really like, it really, like I consider it part of my work as a PhD student now. And it's really been shifting a lot of the, the, the uh, not only the focus, but really kind of eye-opening on the kind of work you can do within a community. And I've seen the co-founders, so Reddit and Kira, who co-founded this, I think they've been struggling with this question of how do you make this shift? And they've been putting a lot of this work to, to, to really show how this kind of community and other efforts similar to this um, uh, show that you can do way more work than focus your uh, efforts into something narrow. And of course, that's not to say that you, you shouldn't do the research that you're doing, not at all. It's just that there's way more out there in terms of community engagement, learning from experts, and that really is showing more on the long term than in the, in the short time periods that we have in different phases of our career. So making that more visible throughout this process, I think, is, is really important. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I'm at a stage where maybe I also, there's a lot of people who know more about the efforts ongoing for admissions and for tenure cases. So I'm sure I have very limited information on that. Now, I, I just want to say uh, as an example, I appreciate you, you doing that, but Solong wears two hats and, and just to show the importance of making the process right, Microsoft a, a pioneer the process of hiring people in the autism spectrum uh, and they completely change uh, their interviewing process uh, uh, and they have been very successful and they keep working on that but that's one example that started from the hiring process itself so so any comments along that you want to make on that yeah i mean i think there's this interesting tension between um formalizing some of these decision-making processes as a mechanism to address existing biases and inequalities, right? So often if we leave the decision-making very open-ended and subjective, uh, then many of these problems can be reproduced and, and a lot of bias obviously can creep in. And so there's evidence to suggest that like formalized decision-making is one important method to over overcome some of those problems. But of course, formalized decision-making has its own problems, which is largely what I've been working on for the past couple of years. Um, and I think, you know, as you were saying, Guillermo, like the things that are easy to measure are those things that are often the ones that are prioritized. So it's been, I mean, now that I'm on the other side, having, you know, graduated and gotten a job and now being on some of these hiring committees and then going through the process of looking at this tremendous set of excellent candidates, it's very upsetting when you realize the heuristics you fall back on to kind of evaluate people. Um, and, um, and so like, you know, I think the challenge here is like, what is easy to kind of measure and quantify is the thing that gets prioritized. Um, and in some cases, like related to what I was saying, there's like a huge amount of detail that is not easily measured that really is tremendously important to the evaluation. Um, and I think one way of making progress on these fronts is to think of other ways of integrating these considerations into the decision-making process. But of course there's like trade-offs here in the sense that the ideal decision-making process is going to be very expensive and time-consuming and so on. Um, and so where we're able to find ways to efficiently and like, you know, uh, cheaply integrate these things, that can have a huge effect. And I think we should be trying to really make gains there. Yeah, yeah inspired by Guillermo. Actually, I, now I have a grand challenge for AI faculty, right? It's actually really going to be wonderful. Would AI faculty accept if they believe that all the methods are so wonderful, right? Develop a learning system for recommending their own admission and tenures, right? Also provide explanations to why they're denial of tenures or promotions. And also provides private, because see, this is a system we have the best documentation, the data, right? Everybody has a, every university almost uniform recommendation letters, publication list, you know, teaching, you know, all wonderful findings, right? All those factors, all the collaborators, 
social network. Of course, there's a lot of privacy we have to preserve. Can we develop a system? If everybody believe, right? We're in the AI age. For only, we start with AI faculty, right? You have to accept, uh, you know, eat your own fruit, right? Or do you accept such a system um, with all the data provided to provide the uh, pro protected privacy, make the recommendation, and you accept that? We'll see, maybe run our own experiments, see how it will work yet. So just let, let me just, yeah, I like your experiment. So first of all, I'm, I'm glad, as I say before, that we have young people leading these, but let me just tell one anecdotic. I, I have a very good friend that I admire a lot and got his first faculty job in one of the top math departments in the planet with no publications at all, no zero and i asked him how how and he looked at me and said very simple they interviewed me and they read my phd thesis and why do i need a publication why the department needed three anonymous reviewers to help in a decision when the department has some of the best mathematicians on the planet to read my thesis but as Solon was saying, that wasn't easy. 20 faculty have to read a thesis and evaluate a thesis, but because it's a very serious department, they did it. And they got him the job and they proved themselves right. Makes much more sense than three anonymous reviewers making a decision, this paper is in or out, but one is very easy. You just Google search, the other you have to pay attention. So let me just finish with a question that is on the chat and then I'm gonna let you uh, 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 spend the rest of your day and weekend. The question reads, what do you think are the most promising approaches in terms of making algorithms auditable and interpretable? Either from yourself or that you see in the community uh, relates to this and relates to his question. If you hire this person, Explain me why, and can I audit you of why you hire this person or promote it? So maybe we, we start with Salon and then we give the last word to, to Anna to close this wonderful session. I guess maybe I'll just say something that I said a few minutes ago, which is that I would often want to understand the motivation for the audit. You know, what is the exact property that you're concerned with? Um, because if I better understand that, then I might be able to tell you whether I think even like an explanation is the best way to achieve that. In some cases, it may be. And in fact, there can be sort of like procedural or dignitary reasons why you just feel like you are owed an explanation. Um, but in other cases, if you're concerned with discrimination or disparate impact or robustness or these other, other properties, um, then there may well be other tools in the toolbox that we can use. Um, and so, um, you know, my way of answering this is that there is no right best way of doing things. I think this is very contingent on your goals and the particular domain where the model is being used. Um, and we should think really deeply about the property. What is the property we care about? Because then, then then I think the problem becomes a little bit easier. Then you can actually say, I think here's the method that will help you kind of best assess whether the model has this property you care about. Um, and yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm excited because there's actually a tremendous amount of activity uh, on this topic on ex explanation and interpretability. And there's many, many, many different methods that kind of do different things. And so there's granularity here. We can actually provide lots of different kinds of explanations. Great, thank you. Anna, you have the last words. Thank you. No, and thank you for all your kind words. It's really reassuring and inspiring to hear from all of you talk about like making this process of, for, for, for people like me, like students and other people more, uh, easy to navigate. So so I'm just really happy to hear all your thoughts on that. Um, and to bring back to, to your last questions regarding interpretability and explainability, there's there are, I, I have seen a lot of also recent work that tries to do that. And a lot of it, I, it, it, it encounters obstacles one side from, you know, the fact that a lot of algorithms are private or you need to respect some data privacy. And on the other hand, that it's just really hard to run experiments um, on on and to find a causal reasoning for different uh, issues like 
do recommendations on YouTube make people more polarized or not? That's just a very difficult experiment to even design. So there's a question of how do you design these behavioral experiments in a way that, you know, people in other fields have tried to do it for so long and have some tools for that from like political science, for example, and statistics. Um, so what can, I think there's a lot of tools that we can employ from there to really understand some issues. I think you're, it's also bringing back to a question of how much regulation do we can we bring into a system and how much of that is useful and needed to bring more transparency into a system. So regarding public data, there's been a lot of work that tries to make this more transparent. Like there's a New York City like tax force on how public algorithms should be using public data. There's just much, much harder to do that on, on the on the uh, private uh, sector, right? So there's a lot of differences that Solon has talked about and that we see between uh, how EU does it and how the U US view it. And I think there's a lot more work needed to start thinking about auditing that's really meaningful. That is even if we, we were, are able to answer the question of what exactly are we auditing for and how can we protect the da data when we are doing audits. But thank you, thank you again for all your questions and discussion. Thank you, both of you, Solon and Anna. We know we are in great hands uh, because you are working on this. And, and let me just finish with a pledge that to both of you and everybody that has been listening for this hour and a half, uh, we will meet again. Uh, there will be another conference or another sometime in the future. And I invite you both uh, and those that want to share for a dinner that it's on me and we can continue this conversation in a in a just a dinner table at the next time that we meet at the conference and and the best of luck in in the next few months until that happens <laughs>